Dear fellow activists, I thank the League of Filipino Students, National and its University of Santo Tomas chapter for inviting me to participate in this webinar titled Exposing Toxic Relationship Signs Imperialist U.S. is an Abusive Partner and to discuss the topic of love triangles and external affairs Philippines caught between U.S. and China. Let me discuss the relations of the Philippines with U.S. imperialism and then with Chinese imperialism. In the concluding part of my presentation, I shall consider the sharpening inter-imperialist contradictions between the U.S. and China and look at the dangers and opportunities that arise from these contradictions. U.S. imperialism has the monstrous record of successfully waging a war of conquest against the Philippine Republic and the Filipino people from 1899 onwards. In the process, it killed at least 1.5 million Filipinos. As a result, it has been able to dominate the Philippines in an all-round way, economically, politically, militarily, and culturally, in violation of national sovereignty and democratic rights of the Filipino people. I agree with you that the relationship within U.S. imperialism and the Philippines is toxic. With the exception of the Japanese occupation during World War II from 1942 to 1945, the U.S. was able to impose its colonial rule on the Filipino people from 1902 to 1946 and then granted a bogus kind of independence to the Philippines on July 4, 1946 and thereby shifted from colonial to semi-colonial or neo-colonial rule over the Philippines with the Filipino puppet politicians allowed to run all levels of the counter-revolutionary state of the local exploiting classes of big compradors and landlords. This false kind of independence was preconditioned by the U.S. RP Treaty of General Relations in 1946, which retained the U.S. military bases on Philippine territory, the property rights of U.S. corporations and U.S. control of foreign trade and diplomatic relations. To this day, the U.S. has been able to dominate the Philippines by using a series of treaties, agreements, and arrangements to bind the country and the people against their own sovereign interests and, right, and rights. For this purpose, the U.S. has been able to use the collaboration of the Comprador Big Bourgeoisie, the landlord class, and the bureaucrat capitalists. To adjust the Philippines to the requirements of foreign monopoly capitalism, the U.S. has brought about a semi-feudal economy run by the city-based comprador big bourgeoisie and the rural-based landlord class, and by training political puppets, mainly from these exploiting classes and the middle social strata, to do the bidding of the U.S. and become bureaucrat capitalists. After using such legal devices as the Parity Amendment, in the 1935 Constitution, the Bell Trade Act of 1946, the Quirino Foster Agreement of 1950, and the Laurel Langley Agreement of 1955 to ensure U.S. economic dominance over the Philippines, the U.S. has taken cover under multilateral foreign investment laws and treaties and all kinds of economic trade and financial agreements under the auspices of the IMF, World Bank, World Trade Organization, and the Asian Development Bank. To this day, the U.S. remains the number one foreign investor in the Philippines and the number one largest export market. It also accounts for 43% of hot money inflow. U.S. corporations are dominant with the assistance of the Comprador Big Burusi of Spanish, Chinese, and Filipino ancestry, which acts as the chief trading and financial agents in a semi-feudal economy characterized by the exchange of raw materials and some manufacturers from the Philippines and capital goods and consumer goods from abroad. Japan is the number two largest foreign investor in the Philippines, but is the number one provider of so-called official development assistance. Yet the largest part of this ODA is tied aid and spent on Japanese materials, equipment, and contractors. China, even including Hong Kong, is only the distant number three largest foreign investor in the country in relation to the U.S. and Japan. It has become the number one trading partner of the Philippines, especially since 
2013, it steadily came to this position after it started to dump cheap Chinese consumer goods and after it became the global manufacturing base for semiconductors and other products after the Asian financial crisis of 1997. Most imports from China are not even Chinese, but from U.S., Japanese, and other foreign transnational corporations located there to take advantage of its cheap labor. China also enjoys certain advantages in trading due to the collaboration of Chinese and Filipino Chinese big compradors. The USRP military basis agreement of 1947 was not renewed in 1991 as a result of the demand of the broad masses of the Filipino people who were indignant over the fact that the Marcos fascist dictatorship had used economic and military relations with the U.S. in order to maintain autocratic rule. But the USRP Mutual Defense Treaty of 1951 has continued to bind the Philippines and its military forces to the aggressive policies of U.S. imperialism. The USRP Military Assistance Agreement of 1947 has also persisted to allow the U.S. to control the security policy, military planning, indoctrination of military officers, intelligence exchange, and armaments of the counter-revolutionary semi-colonial state. Soon enough, the U.S. imperialists were able to obtain the series of military agreements to authorize and facilitate the deployment of U.S. forces and de facto military bases. The agreements include the Visiting Forces Agreement, or BFA, in 1999, Mutual Logistics Support Agreement, the latest uh, MLSA in 2002, the Enhanced uh, Defense Cooperation, EDCA, of uh, 2014, and so many operational and supply agreements. U.S. imperialism is the biggest terrorist in the entire history of mankind, responsible for the mass killing of 25 to 30 million people since after World War II. Especially since after September 11, 2001, it has used the term terrorism as a pejorative expression against the anti-imperialist and democratic forces and as pretext for unleashing wars of aggression and staging false flag operations by CIA-trained mercenaries posing as Islamic jihadists. Quite recently, on January 11, the Duterte regime made the threat to abrogate the BFA to create the impression that he was favoring China, drawing away from the U.S. and forging an independent foreign policy. It did not take long before Duterte exposes incorrigible puppetry to U.S. imperialism and his shallow, deceptive character by backing out of his false threat after just a few months on June 2. All the while, other military agreements aside from the BFA have remained valid and in effect, and the regime has continued to receive U.S. military assistance and collaborate with U.S. military forces under Operation Pacific Eagle Philippines. Since the moment he set out to take the presidency, Duterte has always been surrounded by bureaucrats and generals who are rabid agents of U.S. imperialism, as president, he has done nothing to undo the all-round U.S. dominance over the Philippines. In fact, he has promised Trump to terminate the peace negotiations with the NDFP, wipe out the revolutionary movement of the people by all means, and deliver charter chains, allowing U.S. corporations the unlimited right to own Philippine land, exploit natural resources, and operate public utilities and all kinds of businesses. Thus, Trump has practically given Duterte the license to form a civilian military junta called the National Task Force, ELCA, to further militarize his regime, escalate state terrorism in the name of anti-communism, and prepare the ground for a full-scale fascist dictatorship. He has already used the COVID-19 pandemic to form the interagency task force to carry out the lockdowns as dress rehearsal for military and police control of population and resources under a projected fascist dictatorship and to railroad a bill of state terrorism that negates democratic rights and makes super superfluous the declaration of martial law. The U.S. does not just use economic and military means to dominate the Philippines. It has also used cultural, educational and other propaganda means to dominate the Philippines to combat the demand of the youth and the national democratic movement for a national, scientific, and mass 
cultural and educational system. The U.S. uses various ways to control the educational and cultural policy of the reactionary state and thus perpetuate their influence over the politicians, bureaucracy and professionals and in effect among the masses. As university activists, you are aware of how the U.S. uses its own official agencies and multilateral agencies, private philanthropic foundations, business corporations, the mass media, social media, publications and films, and certain subjects and textbooks in the curricula to propagate colonial mentality and influence the thinking of faculty members and students, the entire intelligentsia and broad masses of the people to follow the U.S. imperialist line on historic and current issues. The Philippines established diplomatic and trade relations with the People's Republic of China in 1975. The Marcos fascist dictatorship felt confident to establish such relations because the U.S. and China had been on a path to rapprochement since the Nixon visit to China in 1972. It became easier for Sino-Philippine relations to develop after the Dengue coup in 1976 and China's adoption of capitalist reforms and opening up for integration in the world capitalist system in 1978. The U.S. established diplomatic relations with China in 1979 and proceeded to concede to it low-tech consumer manufacturing for export to the U.S. by way of weaning China from socialism while continuing to press for more capitalist reforms in favor of foreign monopoly firms. The course of capitalist development in China was increasingly characterized by rampant corruption and inflation which ultimately resulted in massive protests and their violent suppression in Beijing and many other Chinese cities in 1989. In the aftermath of such mass protests, the then ruling clique begged for more economic trade and technological concessions from the U.S. and promised to adopt further capitalist reforms, especially the reduction of state-owned enterprises, increase of joint private state sector enterprises, and further loosening of the foreign investment law. The U.S. played hard to please, but made enough concessions in investments and technology transfer to help China stabilize its economy in its rapid conversion to capitalism, advance significantly from cheap consumer manufacturing, and register high growth rates. The rapid growth rate of China, especially its expanding production of cheap consumer goods for export to the U.S. market, had an adverse impact on the so-called tiger economies of East Asia and triggered the Asian financial crisis of 1997. When this crisis occurred, China further expanded its production of cheap consumer goods and became the final platform for assembling semi-manufacturers from the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries. The U.S. was pleased to have China as its main partner in carrying out the imperialist policy of neoliberal globalization and to have China's high growth rate cushioned the falling global growth rate. During the financial crash of 2008 and consequent uh, Great Recession until recently, China was celebrated as the ever-rising star of the world capitalist economy. It has raised its own level of scientific and technological development with the help of technology transfer from the U.S. and elsewhere through foreign direct investments, direct purchases of dual-purpose equipment, and academic exchanges in science and technology. By the time China joined the WTO in 2001, the U.S. under Bush Jr. was pleased with the apparent extent of liberalization of the Chinese economy and the surges of foreign investments there. The Bush regime preoccupied itself with drumming up its so-called war on terror after 9-11, with unleashing wars of aggression in Iraq and elsewhere, and with trying in vain to buoy up the U.S. economy through military Keynesianism, making more and bigger purchase orders from the military-industrial complex. Obama played the houseboy loyal to the interests of U.S. imperialism and continued to pursue wars of aggression. But it was during his regime that U.S. strategy planners began to pay attention to the gravity of the U.S. economic crisis 
as well as the world capitalist system. In the wake of the financial crash of 2008, the high cost of overseas military bases and the wars of aggression away from the Asia-Pacific region and the galloping growth of the public debt burden. The Obama regime noticed the economic and military rise of China and its growing geopolitical potential and ambitions. Thus, by 2012, it called for a strategic pivot to East Asia and stronger economic and security cooperation among the U.S., Japan, and Australia to hold the line in the Pacific. The U.S. was facing up to the challenge of China as it harped on owning 90% of the South China Sea and demanding the return of the Daoyu Islands from Japan. It was also around this time that China started to tout its Benton Road Initiative <clears throat> to reverse Western dominance in maritime trade since the 16th century while consolidating its growing ties with countries across a vast swath of the Asian mainland reminiscent of the ancient Silk Road. China began to build artificial islands in the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines in the West Philippine Sea and claim even the Panatag Shoal or the Scarborough Shoal in violation of Philippine sovereign rights and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The Philippines was therefore compelled to file a case against China before the Permanent Court of Arbitration on January 22, 2013. It won the case on June 12, 2016, but the incoming Duterte regime declared that it would lay aside the judgment. He expected his ruling clique to benefit from Chinese loans for infrastructure projects as well as from lucrative connections with Chinese big compradors on both sides of the South China Sea and with criminal syndicates in drug smuggling and casino operations. The Duterte ruling clique and its cronies are known to have been stashing away their ill-gotten wealth in China. They are thus tied to China and have to play an ambiguous role whenever issues arise publicly against Chinese policies and actions detrimental to the Philippines. Under the Duterte regime, China has been able to build and militarize seven artificial islands in the Philippines EEZ in the West Philippine Sea. It has brought Philippine soil from Zambales and northeastern Mindanao in connection with the frequent smuggling out of mineral ores for China and likewise to serve as landfill for its artificial islands. It has also consolidated its control over the, natural, the national power grid and built cell towers of China, telecom, inside AFP military camps in contradiction with Edgar, even as China has not delivered on most of its promises of loans for infrastructure projects. But it would be even worse if it fulfilled these promises because the loans carry a high interest and require overpriced Chinese contractors, labor, and supplies. In the meantime, the Philippines under the Duterte regime has isolated itself from nearly all other members of the ASEAN, especially Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia, and standing up against the aggressive claims and acts of China in their respective EECs and extended continental shelves. The Duterte regime also runs counter to the position of the U.S. that China must not claim ownership over the high seas, violate the freedom of navigation, and take any aggressive action against the ASEAN states. The position of the Trump regime on China's unlawful claims over the whole of the South China Sea and on keeping free and open the Indo-Pacific maritime route is related to a whole framework of protectionist and punitive measures against China for using state planning and the still dominant state-owned enterprises, supposedly only 3% of Chinese corporations, but in fact in control of the most strategic 30% of the Chinese economy, to achieve strategic economic and military goals. The U.S. has vigorously accused China of using state power to manipulate its economic, trade, and financial policies in violation of global market rules and stealing technology from the U.S. and becoming the chief economic competitor and political rival of the U.S.
From time to time, there are naval and air military shows of strength in the South China Sea by China and by the U.S. independently or together with allies. Sometimes there are expressions of fear by political analysts that war might break out. Frequently, the tyrant Duterte practically gives China the license to occupy the maritime features of the West Philippine Sea by gratuitously saying that he cannot do anything to stop China because he does not have the capability to wage war against China, which would wipe out his troops in any case, in case of any armed conflict. There is no immediate danger of direct all-out war breaking out between the U.S. and China because the latter is obsessed with gaining more time for its so-called peaceful economic rise and because each of these two imperialist powers has enough nuclear weapons to destroy the other. There is a balance of terror between them resulting in mutual deterrence. The two imperialist powers are still subject to certain decision-making processes domestically and under current circumstances in the Philippines, the people have the high potential to counter and defeat a government that is poised to launch a nuclear war and cause a catastrophe of global scope. For some years to come, the crisis of the world capitalist system, including inter-imperialist rivalries, will worsen, but the imperialist powers will avoid a direct war between any of them. As much as possible, they would rather shift the burden of crisis to the underdeveloped countries and launch wars of aggression against them or mild them in regional and local proxy wars. That has been the case for 75 years already since after the end of World War II. The nuclear stalemate arose during the Cold War when the Soviet Union developed its own nuclear weapons and delivery system. Major economists and international institutions including the IMF, World Bank and OECD have come to the conclusion that the global economy is now afflicted by a crisis far worse than the still unsolved Great Recession that began in 2008, and even worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s that generated the inter-imperialist contradictions leading to World War II. COVID-19 has aggravated the crisis, but the root cause is the ever-worsening crisis of overproduction, the bankruptcy of the imperialist policy of neoliberal globalization, and the sharpening struggle for a redivision of the world among the imperialist powers. The inter-imperialist contradictions between the US and China and their respective alliances with other imperialist powers will escalate and will expose the weaknesses of both sides. At the same time, the anti-imperialist and democratic struggles of the proletariat and peoples of the world will intensify and generate the conditions favorable for the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. The strategic decline of the U.S. will continue. Meanwhile, the efforts of the U.S. to contain and cut down the economic and military rise of China will have adverse effects on both China and the U.S. The trade war between the two imperialist powers does not solve, but aggravates the crisis of overproduction and sharpens the struggle for a redivision of the world among the imperialist powers. But for some more years to come, the imperialist powers can still find ways of cutting down each other through calibrated adversarial means, including covert cyber or bi biotech operations and regime change strategies, but short of a direct all-out conventional or nuclear war. The inter-imperialist contradictions generate dangers and opportunities. Under current circumstances, the worst kind of danger for a country like the Philippines is to become a complete captive and pawn of any imperialist power, whether the U.S. or China, or to become a confused victim of these two imperialist powers. But on the, on the contrary, the Philippines under a patriotic leadership can take advantage of the opportunities generated by the inter-imperialist contradictions and avail of the ASEAN to counter the most outrageous impositions of any imperialist power. With regard to problems posed by China's claim of ownership of nearly all of the South China Sea, the ASEAN countries can agree with nearly all countries of the world that the right of free navigation in the high seas must be respected and be so exercised 
by countries critical of China's expansionist ambitions as to help prevent China from violating said right and from crossing over from its own EEZ and ECS to take over those that belong to the Philippines and other ASEAN states. In the face of the traitorous character of the Duterte regime, the Filipino people and their patriotic and progressive forces must do everything in their power to oust it as soon as possible and intensify the demand for China to respect the 2016 judgment of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in favor of the Philippines in accordance with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, as well as encourage the other ASEAN countries to assert their own sovereign and maritime rights against expansionist policy and actions of China, and avail of the legal precedent set by the 2016 judgment of the Permanent Arbitration Court in favor of the Philippines. The ASEAN countries can take all possible legal and political initiatives to invoke said judgment as precedent and discourage China from violating their rights. The Philippines and other ASEAN countries can present their respective complaints against China and demand compensation for damages before the appropriate agencies of the United Nations and file cases in the appropriate courts that can make the assets of China and certain countries answerable for Chinese obligations or liabilities. The point is to require China to withdraw from the artificial islands it has built, militarized and occupied in the West Philippine Sea, and to pay for the damages that it has done to the marine environment in the same manner as the U.S. was previously compelled to pay two million U.S. two million U.S. dollars for the damage done to Tugbataha Reef by the U.S. warship USS Guardian. The Duterte regime has played up fear of China's military might in making the Philippines desist from exploring and exploiting the hydrocarbon, the oil and gas resources in its own exclusive economic zone. And the traitor, coward, and crook Duterte has even gone so far as to offer to China joint ownership of the resources under the guise of joint exploration and exploitation of said resources. He is in fact giving away to China full control of the technology, personnel, the accounting of costs and production, and the siphoning of the resources to China. The utter stupidity of tyrant Duterte is best demonstrated by his obfuscation of the fact that the Philippines can get the best possible technology and the best possible terms from one of the three companies, Norway's Equinor, previously known as Statoil, Royal Dutch Shell, and the Chevron, that are acknowledged as the best in undersea exploration and exploitation of oil and gas resources. If, for instance, the Philippines can get the best possible terms from the Norwegian oil company, China will not dare to make war on the investments of a company belonging to a NATO member state. The Duterte regime has utterly failed to assert the sovereign rights of the Philippines over its own exclusive economic zone. The marine resources there have an estimated value of 1.5 trillion US dollars and the oil and gas resources an estimated value of at least 26 trillion US dollars. These are more than enough to industrialize the underdeveloped Philippine economy and gauge the revolutionary forces of the people in a just peace agreement, overcome imperialist dominance and bring about a higher quality of life for the Filipino people. Instead, the regime has bowed to the aggressive claims of China and has reduced the Philippines to begging for loans at the most onerous terms for overpriced infrastructure projects that are undertaken by Chinese companies and their own Chinese employees. Yet the Duterte regime has the temerity to occasionally claim that its subservience to China is veering away from the U.S. and developing an independent foreign policy. There can be no bigger lie. The regime has a two-faced character. It has not done anything to cut down the all-round dominance of the U.S. over the Philippines. It has backed out of its false threat to abrogate the BFA and it's still hell-bent on fulfilling Duterte's 2017 promise to Trump to wipe out the revolutionary movement of the 
Filipino people and change the constitution to allow U.S. and other foreign corporations to own up to 100% of land, natural resources, public utilities, and other business enterprises in the Philippines. The Duterte regime cannot be trusted to act in the interest of the Philippines and the Filipino people. In fact, it is the fervent desire of the Filipino people to oust this traitorous, tyrannical, murderous, and corrupt regime and obtain justice against its so many grievous crimes. The rights of the Filipino people can best be protected by a government that arises from the revolutionary struggle for national and social liberation against imperialist domination and the local exploiting classes of big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists. Thank you.